I'm going to talk about a regressive stain setup. Now, a regressive stain setup, how you're going to know it's regressive is it um, has alcohol, acid alcohol in the stain setup. In our laboratory, we use a 0.3% acid alcohol. If you don't see an acid alcohol in your stain setup, it's highly likely that the stain setup is for a progressive stain. And today we are going to be showing you, or I'm going to be showing you, a re regressive stain. That's where we overstain and then take some of the stain out with an acid alcohol. Here's the stain setup. We start off with three xylenes. In our case, we have xylene substitute called Safe Clear, which is a mixed naphthol or aliphatic hydrocarbon. It's um, similar terminology. Um, Something that you want to note is that this will take a little bit longer to deparaffinize in this stain setup because we are using the Safe Clear. And because we're using the Safe Clear, we can have this out on the counter for this demonstration. I've got two 100% alcohols, the first, and then I've got a 95% alcohol and an 80% alcohol. This is going to be for our deparaffinization and hydration step, and then we go into water and we use just tap water. On the other end, when we start our staining, we've got uh, Harris hematoxylin, and I'll talk more about the hematoxylins here in a few minutes. And I've since filtered the hematoxylin and put that here because you have to f filter Harris or um, pretty much any um, regressive hematoxylin. We've got a 0.3% acid alcohol. We've got a bluing. I use lithium carbonate, saturated lithium carbonate in our laboratory. You can use ammonium hydroxide, a 0.3% ammonium hydroxide. We have 80% alcohol. Then we go into our eosin for our background staining. And we have 95% alcohol because now we're going to start our um, actual differentiation and um, dehydration step before we go into xylene and cover slipping. So we have 95% alcohol. I, some laboratories just have 200% and that's sufficient for them. We happen to like to use 300% alcohols for this purpose, for the um, dehydration purpose. And then we go on to our xylenes. In our case, right at this moment, I'm using the Safe Clear. In our stain setup, I happen to be using these buckets, these type of stain um, reagent buckets. If you, the more common buckets to use that you can purchase are this style. One thing you need to know about this particular style is any xylene or xylene substitute needs to go in the green buckets because otherwise it will melt and eat away at this, the clear ones. So remember that in your stain setup if you use this style. Um, they use actually a smaller rack for that where you can use this style or this style with a handle or this style, and it has a hand, longer handle also um, that you can purchase that comes with that stain kit that has this style buckets. So, and then all your alcohols and other reagents and dyes would go into the clear bucket. So make sure that you remember that these are for xylene and xylene substitute, the green ones, because um, they're made with a different type of plastic, and these are for all other reagents in your stain setup if you use this style bucket. I want to um, talk about, let's start off with talking about the Harris hematoxylin and some of the reagents themselves. Harris hematoxylin or any hematoxylin, the distinguishing thing about it is the uh, metal mordant that forms a dye lake. Hematoxylin itself doesn't um, stain um, the, the nuclei, right, unless it has a metal mordant in it that forms what's called a dye lake. So you've got the dye, the mordant, and those two together form the dye lake. Now Harris hematoxylin, in the, this case, used to have mercury or mercuric chloride, I believe, in it. That's no longer um, environmentally sound, so they use a different metal. In the case of this particular brand, they use um, ammonium aluminum sulfate as the mordant. Now if you had um, gills or gills two, which is used typically for a progressive stain setup. The uh, metal mordant, I believe, is aluminum sulfite. But you'll have to verify that yourself. Just know the main thing is, is that the uh, metal is 
the difference, one of the biggest differences between the different hematoxins. In the case of like a Weigert's hematoxin, the metal mordant would be ferric chloride, which is an iron metal. We use um, Harris hematoxin in our lab, and this particular brand is through VWR. It's actually um, comes through, it's the VWR label, but if you read it closely, you'll see that this is also from Leica Surgipath, and it's the same exact thing as the Leica Surgipath Harris hematoxin, gallon of Harris hematoxin. It just happens to have the VWR label. Um, we like this particular hematoxin either through VWR, which is again is through like a surgery path, because it's very, very strong. In our laboratory, we get a lot of different fixatives. We get things that are very overfixed. We get um, Buens, which doesn't like to pick up hematoxin very well sometimes. And we get Davidson's fixative, which again doesn't like to pick up hem hematoxin as well. So we have to push our hematoxin sometimes. So we choose this really, really dark hematoxin for that purpose. Another thing you're going to want to note about hematoxin, not all Harris's are alike. Some companies will add an acid component to stabilize the hematoxin to give a more consistent staining feature. Um, and it kind of ripens it a little bit quicker and some other solutions for that. Um, this particular brand of hematoxin does not add acid to it. So you've just got the, the dye, the metal mordant, and water in this particular brand. And I think that that's important, again, because if you have an acid component to it, it's only going to stain to a certain point and not stain further. And it doesn't really last as long, the hematoxin, as this one does. The only problem we have with this is it does get a little bit too dark occasionally, and it doesn't come to us fully ripened depending on the company and, and, and what, what com time frame they, they um, made this batch of hematoxin. And you kind of have to know your hematoxins and know some of the nuances of it um, to, to distinguish that as you're staining. What I use in, in those that are kind of some of the old timers that understand hematoxin is I actually use um, the filter itself. Now Harris hematoxin um, and a lot of the regressive hematoxins have to be filtered prior to use. We filter it in the morning, and then if, it, if we happen to need it later in the afternoon, we might filter it again. Um, when I filter the hematoxin, what I'm really looking for is to see what, kind of have an idea what that hematoxin is going to be for me, is what it looks like in the filter. In this case, I'm seeing it's really purpley blue overall. And when I see that, it's letting me know that this probably, this batch wasn't really, really ripened, isn't, um, just yet like I'd like it to be. I can do one of two things. I can add a little bit of acid to it if I want to in the solution itself. I choose not to do that. I just know this is probably going to stain darker for me and I might run a test control initially to see how I might want to make my adjustments. I like to use a kidney, um, a section of kidney at four or five microns just to see what my hematoxin is doing. That's a good control, overall control or what my stain is going to look like. Since I see that this is darker, I'm going to expect this stain to be a little bit darker and adjust my time frames accordingly. What I really want to see with a beautifully ripened hematoxin is I want to see this almost a maroon red down in the middle, and I want to see this darker purple that I see here more towards the top, and then I know, oh, it's beautifully ripened and, and perfect stain. and. Um, what I don't want to see, though, is the, the worst thing you could see is for it to be an overall maroon color. If you see that, your hematoxin is pretty well expired. It's not going to stain properly, and it's just getting old, and it's um, wore out its usefulness. So again, if you see that overall really kind of a paler maroon color, just know your hematoxin is not likely to stain well. And that's that's a good little technique to know your, your dye and under, have an understanding of it. Another thing is um, what people don't understand is this is a natural dye and because it does have ripening with light and air exposure and changing what you have on Monday even if you've only used it once and then you come back to the same solution, the same dye 
nothing has changed except that it's been exposed to air and light and then you use that again it's going to be slightly different and have some different properties than it was on Monday morning. So that's something that you need to think about as you're using your dyes and stains. How you can overcome that and a lot of clinical laboratories overcome it is because they change it and use it so frequently that, um, that that's not a problem. When you're in a research setting, you may not change that as frequently, so you're going to have to make your adjustments accordingly, and you're going to have to look at that filter and see how that dynamic has changed by um, kind of overseeing what those color shifts are in your filter and keep that in mind as you're staining with, with, this, with the hematoxylin. Let's go on to, um, oh, I want to also talk about a little bit more about hematoxylin. Um, if you see a Harris hematoxin with some acid ad added to it in its um, MSDS form or on its um, chemical list on the side of the bottle, you want to know that, number one, it's probably going to stain to an endpoint. You're not going to be able to push it any darker, not likely. Number two, it's not likely to last as long in, in your stain setup because it has the acid component. But if you want more of a consistent stain, um, you're going to like that hematoxylin maybe a little better. And in actuality, you can even take this Harris hematoxylin um, that I had, and you can, um, you can add, for every 100 mils, you can add a mil of glacial acetic acid to it and stir that up. And you can um, kind of ripen it yourself and, and make yourself um, that acid component and make yourself a nice hematoxylin and have a little more control over things. We don't do that in our lab. We just use it dark, and we make our adjustments accordingly. Um, the other thing too, I think I talked about GILS-1 and GILS-2 hematoxylin. Those are usually typically used in counter stains for um, immunohistochemistry. The difference between those are the metal mordant in them, again, and the concentration. So GILS-1 and GILS-2 hematoxylin, if you're using it for a counter stain for immunohistochemistry, just note that one is twice as um, dilute as the other. And that's the difference between those two hematoxylins. Also, Surgipath has this, um, you can buy actual stain kits. It's a little bit pricey to do it this way, but it gives you a little more control and certainty over your stain. And um, we can't afford to, to use this. Um, this was um, given to us by them to, for us to demo. It actually was a quite nice stain. Um, this one does have an acid component to it. It does have that nice color shift um, from the um, kind of purpley in the middle of the filter to that nice blue edges. So that was good to see. It's a great, I thought it was really, really good as a counter stain for immunohistochemistry. So, and in this instance, their um, acid alcohol component is a very, very dilute um, acid that they use. They're defined. This is similar to our acid alcohol. And then they have this blue buffer that they make, which would be similar to our um, lithium carbonate or ammonium hydroxide. But it's in a, a complete stain setup with some recommendations on um, timing and control. And the things that, that I'm going to discuss today, if you use another stain setup like this, will apply to that also. Let's talk about eosins. Um, we started off using an eosin Y. So eosin Y is a nice, just general eosin to use. We happen to like um, the Surgipath, the Leica Surgipath eosin Y. Even though it doesn't say that here, this is indeed eosin Y. Um, that gave us a little bit of a lighter eosin, and it didn't give us much to differentiate out and play with. And we wanted to see some more brilliant color shifts. The perfect eosin stain will have three different color shifts of pink and not interfere with the nuclear staining of the hematoxylin. This eosin Y gave us um, the shades of pink, but they weren't as brilliant as we were, were desiring um, for our laboratory and our imaging purposes. Although for quite a while, we were pretty satisfied with it. And that's just a determination, that's a um, preference that you may want to check out and try. Um, when we do an eosin Y, we actually do shake the bottle. And any eosin, we shake the bottle and before we put it into our stain setup, make sure it's mixed well. What we've switched to was an eosin with floxine. Now this is a much more brilliant stain. 
um, counter stain, and it has brilliantly the three um, color shifts with the fuchsin, beautiful fuchsin of the blood cells and some of the tissue uh, membrane components. And it also um, had the three, the lighter color shifts, and then a much lighter in the overall background in the tissue components. And that's what you really want to see. The only thing with this was, uh, we've had a couple complaints with from our researchers that it was a little bit too brilliant for them. So we've had to really take some extra time to differentiate this one out and really cut back on our timing.